Right, well, um, thank you all for coming. I'll uh, stand. Uh, my name's Martin Platt, and I was the BBC Africa editor for nearly 30 years. Uh, I'm a Cape Tonian, so I'm not entirely foreign to all of this. But um, I've decided the, the reason that we're here is because it's, it's most peculiar. It is a black hole. It's the one black hole I cannot get from my house on Journey Planet to this hotel. So I reckon this is where all you South Africans have your, uh, shall we say, interesting uh, meetings. Um, perhaps not, not in public rooms. Uh, so I think this is why you guys all know it and this is why you've chosen it. But anyway, well done for getting here. Um, we have uh, absolutely fascinating uh, guests here and two people who really represent the two bastions of what have sort of kept South Africa on the road. I'm generally quite optimistic about South Africa, but I must be honest, you know, in the last few years, my optimism has, shall we say, been slightly tempered. Um, you know, the, the situation has not been uh, what it might be, but the two organizations, or two, two of the organizations which have really held things together, one is the Institute of Race Relations, um, and the other with Davis and Sarah is representing, and well, I don't know, are you representing or just speaking on? I'm representing. You're representing, excellent. I, I work for Good. And Mark Oppenheimer, who represents the law. And um, I mean, I don't know if you've looked through his cases, but I mean, he has done some absolutely stellar cases. And uh, one of the most interesting, he was just telling me about before we, we came in here, is about whether it'll be possible to actually, whether they're going to ban the old South African flag, which I must say was something I never even thought was possible. But um, let me not say any more, but hand over who's going to go first. I will. Okay, up to you. Great, thank you very much, Martin, for that warm introduction. Sorry. No problem? He's one that didn't know where, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, well, thank you very much to everyone who's come here this evening. My name's David Ansara, and I'm an analyst with the Institute of Race Relations. And the IRR is a, is a think tank, an advocacy and lobbying group that was established in 1929. And uh, throughout the dark days of apartheid, was a, a staunch opponent of the racial segregationist policies uh, that existed at the time and spent many decades uh, documenting uh, the injustices uh, of, of racial segregation in South Africa. Uh, and uh, the IRR continues to do that work today. So uh, in uh, our offices in Richmond and Johannesburg, we have, we have a plaque, and on that plaque reads the following uh, statement. We stand for classical liberalism, an effective way to defeat poverty and tyranny through a system of li limited government, a market economy, private enterprise, freedom of speech, individual liberty, property rights, and the rule of law. Uh, and uh, as in the past, uh, we continue to be very staunch critics of government policy uh, and uh, are recognized as an independent voice uh, in terms of our commentary on, on political dynamics and, and the economy more broadly. Uh, so the purpose of this talk today, and I'll only speak for about 15 minutes before I hand over to, to Mark Oppenheimer. Uh, I've invited Mark to join us today just because uh, of his specialist insight into expropriation without compensation. And uh, I think that that is, is probably the most urgent and pressing policy issue and political issue in South Africa at the moment. Um, and. Uh, you, you know, I think it's important uh, for us to, to discuss that in the broader political context. I think there's, um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, cautious optimism at the presidency of Cyril Ramaphosa, but I think like, like Martin, some of that optimism is starting to be tempered. And, and I'll, I'll give you some evidence as to, as to why I think the, the Ramaphosa long game theorists are, are off the mark in terms of their analysis. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, generally provide a, a, a post-electoral update uh, and our view as an institution about some of the, uh, the, the kind of broader trends that, that we witness at the moment. So um, in terms of the, uh, the recent national elections, so uh, we had uh, some interesting trends there, uh, which many of you will be familiar with. So we had uh, the, the ANC and the DA, the, the two largest political parties, both decline in terms of their, their national support. 
Uh, so we had the ANC going uh, down to 57.5%, so that was a 5% drop from the 62% in 2014. Uh, the DA uh, went down from 22.2% in 2014 to 20.7% in 2019. Uh, and then on the extremes of the political spectrum on the far left and, and, the, and the conservative right, uh, we saw uh, on the left the, the rise of the economic freedom fighters contesting only their second general election and nearly doubling their support from 6.3% in 2014 to 10.7% uh, in, in 2019. Uh, and the Freedom Front Plus, uh, uh, against all expectations, um, they, they garnered 414,000 votes in total, so they went from 0.9% in the last election up to 2.38% in the May election. Um, so uh, I think what was telling about these elections was the, uh, the, the, the decline in voter turnout uh, down to 65%, which was a lot lower than, than we were anticipating and many other analysts as well. Um, and I think that that points to a, a broader disaffection with the party political process uh, and, and some of the, um, you know, the uh, shortcomings of the, the major political parties. And in many ways, uh, the resurgence of the, the Freedom Front Plus and the growth of the EFF uh, represents protest votes uh, uh, from the core constituencies of the, the ANC and the, and the DA, respectively. Um, so what, is this, what does this mean to you as South African expats or, or, or people who are interested in developments in South Africa? Uh, you know, we, as the Institute, we spend a lot of time speaking with senior business leaders, members of government, uh, analysts, and, and, and uh, you know, other opinion makers in the country. And w what we've uh, observed uh, since December 2017 is uh, a high degree of expectation around the presidency of, of Cyril Ramaphosa. And uh, you know, going into the Nasrik uh, Party conference in December 2017, uh, we were assured that, that Cyril just needs uh, you know, to win the presidency of the party, and then he can start to uh, address some of the, the, the fundamental structural issues that, that have affected the ANC uh, over, the last, uh, over the last decades. Um, when, he, when he did that, we were, we were promised that no, uh, Ramaphosa needs to become president, he needs to remove Zuma before uh, he can uh, implement some of the changes that he, that, that he uh, has promised to bring. And then when he did that, we were told that no, Cyril needs a, a mandate, Cyril needs 60% uh, in order to uh, you know, achieve his vision for, uh, for, the, this, for the country. And he achieved all of those things. And, and Underpinning that was this assumption that Cyril is this uh, frustrated reformer, that uh, he's been hamstrung by party political processes, he's playing a delicate balancing game within the alliance. Uh, and, you know, even if you assume that Cyril is that, this frustrated reformer, I mean, you can also accept that, uh, that the margin of his victory was very narrow. Uh, in that December 2017 conference, out of 4,500 uh, voting delegates, uh, he won uh, in the region of 170, by a margin of 170, so uh, a very, very slim victory. Um, and, you know, the, the expectation for reform is, you know, due to, I think, a, a deep uh, disaffection with uh, where the country's at at the moment. So. Uh, you know, just in terms of the the economy, uh, the economy is is uh, not generating the kind of growth uh, that that we need to address the fundamental problem problems of, of poverty and unemployment. So, by the narrow measure of unemployment, we have 27.5 percent unemployment, which is a staggeringly high figure for for any market. Uh, if you open the back page of a, an Economist magazine and you look at the, the indicators there, if you look at unemployment, South Africa is, has the highest unemployment rate. Um, and that's only on the conservative definition of unemployment. So uh, if you expand that definition, that, that figure is, is close to about 35%. And for young people, it's even higher. So uh, for, for the youth, the unemployment rate is around 50%. So, so what we have in South Africa, and this is largely due to 
a failure of our, of our labor market regulatory framework is we have 10 million people, just under 10 million people who don't have jobs, which represents a, a fundamental crisis uh, in terms of not just economically but also socially. Um, and uh, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, the Labor Relations Act, these are protections and guarantees that are given uh, to workers, those fortunate enough uh, to, to have jobs, of the 16 million people who are fortunate enough to have jobs. Um, and, and that is a, a function of the uh, political alliance between COSATU, the, the Trade Union Federation, and the ANC. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, one of the, uh, you know, one of the key urgent reforms that is needed in South Africa is to the labor market. And what we've seen, in fact, is a, is a strengthening of protections uh, of the rights of workers. Um, and the Ramaphosa himself was one of the key architects of the national minimum wage. Um, which has been extended uh, to three and a half thousand rand per month or, or, or 20 rand per hour, um, which you might think is not uh, particularly high. And you know, I'm often asked if, if I could live on, on that amount of, of money a month. Um, and my response is usually, well, could you live on zero rands per month? Um, and, and what we have, in effect, the result of this policy is that millions of of the poor and employed have been priced out of the, the labor market. So I think that's just one feature of our economy that is dysfunctional. Uh, but, but generally, our story is one of, of low growth. And Martin, um, if you could just keep an eye on the time for me and just stop me when, I, when I've gone over. Um, uh, we, we will have a Q&A session as well uh, for half an hour after this. So, um, so uh, our GDP figures were released uh, a couple of weeks ago for the first quarter of 2019, and they, they were uh, fairly abysmal. So we had 0% uh, economic growth uh, year on year and minus 3.2% economic growth quarter on quarter. Um, you know, so, and, and out of the, the five quarters that Mr. Ramaphosa has been president, uh, we've had three of those with, with negative growth. So, so the, the new dawn, the um, uh, the, 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 the reforms that publications like the Business Day assume Mr. Ramaphosa wants to implement, we're just not seeing the evidence of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there, there are many other um, kind of core problems. And, you know, I think you, you can spend a long time going through the list of, of, of dysfunctional policy areas, for example, in education where the South African Democratic Teachers Union has a very st strong hold over, uh, over the education system. There's a general hostility towards the private education sector. In healthcare, uh, there is uh, discussions around the state implementing a, a, a national <coughs> health insurance, which would uh, come with an enormous fiscal burden. Uh, there's also uh, problems at ESCOM. So ESCOM is around uh, 420 billion rand in debt, and uh, there are various operational and governance issues that are affecting the utility, uh, with the result that you know we don't have consistent uh, energy security and energy supply in the country. Uh, so you can go through through that list, and and Mark will also speak about the the issue of expropriation, um, but I think it's very important. Uh, you know, when you try to analyze the context of South Africa, to bear in mind uh, the role of ideology uh, and, in particular, the, the National Democratic Revolution uh, as a concept uh, that, that guides the ANC as a, as a kind of under, uh, underpinning philosophy. And, uh, you know, we're, we're often met with some criticism when we, when we raise this issue, but the NDR is a, is a core pillar of uh, the ANC's policy framework, or, or it's a kind of sense of itself. Um, the ANC in 1912 started as a, a, a moderate uh, movement amongst uh, black intellectuals, and then, you know, with the onset of of the apartheid system in the late 40s, uh, the ANC became, you know, increasingly uh, radicalized to the extent that, uh, you know, once once the movement was uh, was banned and forced into exile, it, it then was able to. It was embraced by the Soviet Union, and, and many uh, senior leaders, you know, spent significant amounts of time in, in Moscow and, and East, East Germany. 
Uh, and uh, this culminated in 1969 with the, the Morogoro Conference in Tanzania, where the ANC adopted officially the, the program of National Democratic Revolution. Uh, and attendant to that, uh, there was uh, the idea of colonialism of a special type. So the NDR basically uh, puts forward a, an idea that uh, you know, South, African, South Africa's liberation is contingent on, you know, firstly a, a, a kind of a peaceful transfer of power, but then uh, once, that, once that has occurred, uh, then the, the country must be pushed towards uh, socialism and ultimately a, a communist state. And, and, and two minutes. And, uh, you know, when, when you find yourself confused that, you know, the state wants to play a dominant role in uh, all spheres of society, be it education, healthcare, um, it's uh, undermining of private property rights, I think it's important to remind yourself of uh, you know this particular ideological framework, um, and you know I think if you have that in mind, if you have that understanding, you will, uh, you know, come with a, you know, you won't be surprised by by some of the the, the negative adverse policy developments that that are affecting the country. Uh, so so I just wanted to to leave you with that, and also just to say that uh, you know we've we've produced a, a report called uh, South Africa's Rise or Fall. Uh, it's, it's on your chair. You're welcome to, to take that home uh, and, and read that at your leisure. Um, th there will be a digi digital version available of that, that report as well. But, but it outlines many of the points that I've made today. And, you know, I think just in terms of whether or not we're optimistic or pessimistic, I think that that's, that's a bit of a binary way of looking at it. I mean, I think yeah, we're perhaps uh, cautiously pessimistic. Um, you know, we'd be happy to be, to be proved otherwise. Um, but, you know, I think uh, had we been having this conversation five or ten years ago, you know, we, we would have pointed to a number of the positive developments that happened in, in the mid-2000s under the, the government where, uh, you know, many of these uh, centrally planned economic policies were, uh, you know, were set aside. Uh, the, the GEAR framework, the Growth Employment and Redistribution Framework, was uh, essentially a kind of liberal policy framework that, that favoured growth and the benefits were there to see in the mid-2000s. Um, we had three consecutive years of, of economic growth from 2005 to 2008 um, where our growth rates, rates were in excess of 5%. Um, our expenditure, uh, in terms of government expenditure, we actually were generating more revenue than we were spending, so we had a fiscal surplus. Uh, and this translated into, uh, you know, uh, being able to finance social grants and uh, high levels of economic activity, uh, increased revenues uh, from from corporates and individuals. Um, but you know, we've gradually since 2007, we've seen a jettisoning of those of those policies in favour of, uh, uh, you know, much more interventionist uh, role for the for the state. And you know, I think just reflecting on the the state of the nation address, um, you know, I think that that there was more mu mood music, and there was very little by way of substantive uh, structural reform being offered there. But I'm conscious of time, uh, and I'll hand over to to Mark, who will discuss EWC. Well, David, thank you very much for setting the general landscape. The biggest issue that South Africa is facing at the moment is the threat of expropriation of our compensation. It's been tried by our neighbor upstairs in Zimbabwe um, to devastating effect. And not just for those um, who happen to um, you know, own farms, um, but for the average citizens. Uh, Zimbabwe, as some of you will be aware, had the biggest case of hyperinflation ever known. We had $100 trillion notes, um, which themselves um, came from notes where nine zeros had been chopped off before. They had 90% unemployment. Um, we have it going on in Venezuela as well. Venezuela started off with a constitutional amendment allowing for expropriation of compensation in the most exceptional circumstances. And of course, every case becomes an exceptional circumstance for the greater good. And they have annihilated their economy. They're probably going to beat them on the hyperinflation. They've got millions of people fleeing in exile. But the South African vision is one of we're exceptional. Um, we can do things that other nations can't do because we're the nation of Mandela. 
Um, and so we can try this sort of communist policy and it'll be fine, we will flourish. Um, just trust us, let us give it a chance. And what they've done is rely on a couple of myths, um, which I'm going to try and set aside for you. The first myth is that nothing has been done to set aside the original sin of colonialism, of, of theft of land. Now I think as a liberal you have to recognize that if property was taken from someone at the barrel of a gun, that you have good reasons to have redress for that theft. And the myth is that nothing has occurred, and this is far from the truth. In fact, what has happened from 1995 to 2014 is that a land claims court was set up and people were able to put forward um, their claims. And 1.8 million individuals uh, received compensation. And they could either receive compensation in the form of land or in the form of money. And 97% of all claims that were put forward during this process have been resolved. Another interesting feature of this, of course, um, is this idea that, well, there's this hunger for land, that South Africans really want their land back. But during this process, 90% of people said, I'd like the money, please. I don't actually want a piece of rural land in the middle of nowhere, because money is freedom. Money is the ability to pay off my debts, start a new business, maybe buy a piece of land that I would like in an area where I currently work. Um, this idea that people ought to be sent back to an agrarian economy uh, is built on this sort of strange utopian vision that the ANC seems to have. So I presented in Parliament, and parliamentarians were aghast when they heard that 90% of people chose the money, and they said, yeah, it's a real shame. Those people should have taken the land. Um, there's this idea that it's wrong to exercise your free choices. We know what's best for you as the state. The next thing is this idea that, well, being a farmer uh, is easy. Anybody can do it. I mean, some of you will have little vegetable patches, and you know you can grow some carrots and lettuce, and that's what farming is, really. But the state is already engaged in the process of farming distribution. Uh, to take one example, in the Eastern Cape, they bought um, 236 farms, and they redistributed them. 90% um, of them have failed. So what you've done is take all those workers who are working on those farms and drive them into unemployment. Um, you've devastated an economy, you've, you've jeopardized food security, and you haven't helped anyone. Because farming, turns out, is a rather technical thing. You not only need to know how to do the, the stuff of growing the vegetables or raising the cattle, but you also have to deal with a variety of suppliers in South Africa and abroad. It requires an enormous amount of knowledge and a long network. I spent some time uh, in Natal, talking to sugarcane farmers. These are guys who've been there since 1820. Um, it's generational. The kind of knowledge that these guys have of how you run a system like this um, is not the kind of thing that you can learn overnight. So there's already that problem. So the question is, given that there, this call for expropriation of compensation is really founded on a series of myths, what is to be done given that Parliament has declared that they are going to change the Constitution? After going through this year-long process of hearing submissions from multiple parties, polling the public, um, the, a number of people were invited to write written submissions. I think 700,000 written submissions were sent to Parliament. 65% um, of people said don't change the Constitution. But um, the Parliamentary Committee said we're going to do it anyway. So now what? Well, the difficulty is this. There is no language. Um, President Ramaphosa said absolutely nothing about this burning issue during SONA. We don't know what a constitutional amendment would look like. We have an inkling of what they want, though. There's an expropriation bill um, which said expropriation without compensation would happen in the following circumstances and maybe more. So really you have this kind of rule of law problem where you don't have a closed list. And one of the examples that they give is land held for speculative purposes. Now, what is that? It's a nebulous concept. You go out and you buy a nice flat in London. Um, part of why you buy it is so that you can live there, and part of why you buy it is because you hope it'll appreciate in value. You didn't put your money in the bank. You didn't put it in the stock market. You speculated on property. So you have this difficulty that all things could be viewed as held for speculative purposes. Um, even if you are the kind of person who said, well, I'm going to buy this 
this open field like the, the Mia family did in 1936. It's a long stretch of land between Joburg and Midrand. And they held onto it and didn't develop it uh, up until about 10 years ago. Um, and then opened up uh, Waterfront Estate, um, Waterfall Estate, and had a whole range of developments there. Well, it's their land. They're entitled to do that. The idea that they should be bullied by the state um, and that that land should be confiscated from them, land which they bought themselves with their hard-earned money, um, seems totally unjust. <coughs> so what's the legal strategy? Part of this talk is about how do you stop expropriation without compensation? So I've been giving this talk for a while and I've sort of said it needs to be done on a threefold basis. The first is you've got to fight at the polls um, because in order to change the Bill of Rights, you need a two-thirds majority. And David has told you that the ANC got 57%. So they don't have a two-thirds. But they have the EFF with 10%. And the call to have this um, parliamentary committee investigate expropriation without compensation was done jointly by the ANC and the EFF. So together, they have the numbers. Um, so the fight at the polls has been lost. Um, the next is to kind of change public opinion in the press. The press has largely been captured. Um, the press is highly left-leaning in South Africa. Um, they've bought this distinction, well, they've collapsed the distinction between the need for land reform, in other words, those that have had their land taken from them requiring compensation, and the need to have expropriation without compensation being something totally different, the kind of thing that, as I say, will level the South African economy. And so those two pillars of the fight, I think, are lost, which leaves the courts. And we're dealing with something very novel because our Bill of Rights has never been changed in South Africa's history. It is the most sacred part of our most sacred document. And so the kinds of arguments that are going to be leveled to try and protect it are novel. And I'll spell them out briefly. So the first is that there's actually a section before the Bill of Rights, chapter one of our constitution, which requires a higher threshold to change, which is 75%. And in that section, we talk about the supremacy of the rule of law. And there's an argument that the rule of law is not merely procedural, that it's not just about a cold application of the rule as opposed to the discretion of people, but it has substantive values. Um, and one of those values is the right to property, that you cannot have a functioning, uh, democratic, law-abiding society without this fundamental pillar of property rights. And so the argument is that actually um, Parliament requires the high threshold of 75%. They can get pretty close. Um, there are other left-leaning parties besides the ANC and the EFF, but I don't think they can get there on their own. So that's one argument. The second argument um, is that we have a thing called the limitations clause in the Constitution. And it briefly says that any right in the Bill of Rights can only be limited by a law of general application, provided that it is um, reasonable in an open and democratic society, and then you must follow a kind of rationality test. And we know that um, when courts have looked at this section of the Constitution before, they've said, well, what is an open and democratic society? And they've gone and looked abroad, and they've gone and looked at international standards. And the international standard for expropriation is that when you expropriate, you must pay prompt and adequate compensation. Now, expropriation in and of itself isn't necessarily a problem. In other words, if you want to build a road or a hospital, um, sometimes you need to use private land, and sometimes the person who owns that private land says, I'm not willing to sell it. So the state says, well, unfortunately, we're going to have to expropriate it, but we'll pay you, um, and we'll use a number of factors. So as I said, the international standard is prompt and adequate. In South Africa at the moment, it is just and equitable, and the Section 25 of the Constitution sets out a test. And basically, the idea is that you start off with the market value. Um, and then you can adjust that up or down based on a couple of other factors. So how did you acquire the land? How is it currently being used? Did you receive a loan? Um, can we set that off against you know, what we're going to pay you? Um, but if you remove the requirement to pay compensation at all, well, there's nothing adequate about that. So you would not be doing something that is reasonable. And so the argument is that Section 36 kind of acts as a force field around the rest of the Bill of Rights. And that if the limitation was so severe um, that it required no compensation in all cases, um, well, that would be in of itself unconstitutional unless you remove Section 36. So you'd at least have to have a kind of two-step attack on the Constitution. Um, and what we've tried to do is to kind of create enough um, enough organizations that care about the Constitution, that are willing to fight against the prevailing narrative that this is what justice requires, and say, 
we will fight you to the bitter end. Um, we will ensure that you are you know, wrapped up in, in litigation for years to come because we care about South Africa, we care about the rule of law, we care about property rights, and not just for the rich and the wealthy. It is the poor and the vulnerable who need property rights the most. If you are living in a township and you've managed to stake out the small piece of land, you've got your RDP house and you have title to it, that title unlocks enormous value for you. You can rent that place out, you can sell it, you can move. If you have no title, you have nothing. Um, and so once people realize that this is not something that is only going to affect rich white commercial farmers, this is something that is going to destroy the lives of all South Africans. That's why that press fight is so important and you know, we need to kind of push that narrative. Um, I will say this, there is a reason why we are in London. South Africans care about the view of the international community still. So um, an organization called AfriForum went out to the States recently. Um, they got on Fox News because they know that's what uh, President Trump eats his breakfast cereal to. And uh, they pointed out that this is a serious problem in South Africa. And Trump, in his usual way, sent out a tweet saying, I better get uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, my Secretary of State, to look into this. And that immediately sent shudders down Sir Ramaphosa's spine, saying, guys, can't we come back to the negotiating table? Maybe we can do something here. So there's a reason why we're here, which is that it is useful for those of you that have contacts in the press, that are good writers, that have uh, contacts with politicians, to say, this is the issue for South Africa. Some of you may have shares in South Africa. Some of you may be involved in businesses in London that are exposed to South Africa. And you don't want to see your own financial losses. You have a stake in our nation too. So fight that fight. Doing it from abroad is enormously valuable because we need to try and save our constitution and save our country and we need your help. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, all I can say is if we're looking to uh, Mr. Trump for our salvation, God help us. But um, uh, let's uh, leave that aside. I mean, I was personally hoping that somebody was going to expropriate a feature, but uh, somehow <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get one. Um, if I may just uh, abuse my, my position as chair for a moment, Dave, there's one thing you sort of danced around, which was uh, you sort of said the long view of Ramaphosa is wrong, or you suggested it might be wrong but then you didn't really ever come down in saying what you thought his long-term position was. I mean, do you think he's drunk the Kool-Aid? Do you think he's, he believes in the, in the, uh, the democratic revolution? I mean, or, I mean or, or do you think that he actually secretly doesn't and would like to do what he did, but he's held captive? And where do you come down in, on that position? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh you know, our skepticism arises from, you know, he, his primary concern is going to be maintaining the unity of the, of the party and uh, you're putting the party before the national interest. And it's, it's a, that's a very difficult truth to confront. But, um, you know, I think that that's evidenced in, in the way he's handled the expropriation debate. Uh, you know, I think if he was really a closet reformer, uh, he would have done more to throw sand in the gears of, of this process. Um, you know, if you look back at the Mandela presidency, when he was released from prison uh, in 1991, Mandela went to Davos in Switzerland, met with uh, members of the international investor community, uh, and was told that the policy pro pro programs of nationalization, nationalization of banks and mines that, that were core parts of the Freedom Charter uh, were going to be disastrous for South Africa. And, and Mandela really, he unilaterally changed many of those uh, provisions uh, and he rewrote his speech on the fly and, and said that you know, the ANC is not going to, to follow that trajectory. Um, Ramaphosa hasn't been as bold. Uh, he's taken much more of a consensus building approach, uh, consulting with various constituencies, uh, business, labor, government, and, and trying to do the, this balancing act. Um, and you know, so the, the long view was, was let him do this balancing act, and then once, uh, you know, once everything is well aligned, then he will push through with reforms. Um, and you know, now that he's 
he's formed his cabinet. The cabinet is, is stocked with senior leaders of the South African Communist Party. So Bladen Zamande, the former uh, Secretary General of the SACP, has returned um, as Minister of Higher Education. Uh, you know, there are a number of uh, appointments to the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, Ibrahim Patel is, uh, you know, comes from an orthodox Marxist background, is very uh, critical of business, uh, sees business as something from which you extract concessions rather than as a, as a partner for growth. Um, you know, so uh, given the enormity of our challenges, uh, ESCOM being one of the main ones, um, you know, I just don't see the president recognizing that the, the extent of the difficult trade-offs that are going to have to be made. And, you know, you, what we need now is, is less consensus and we need more bold decisions. And those bold decisions require um, costs as well and, and trade-offs. Um, and I think uh, Carol Payton was writing in the Business Day this morning saying that the problem with M Mr. Ramaphosa is that he wants to have his cake and eat it. And he, he, he he, he doesn't really have the political capital within the alliance to, to kind of push back against some of these uh, poor policies. And, and, you know, that can only lead us to believe that either he doesn't have the authority to do so uh, or he doesn't have the, the will and the desire. Um, so, I mean, I can't, can't read into his mind, but all I can judge are his actions, and his actions aren't very encouraging at the moment. Uh, right, well, let's open to the floor now. Yes. Um, sorry, for the purposes of recording, could we have you speaking to the microphone? And just introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. <coughs> Please pardon me, I have flu. Please pardon me, I have flu. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My name is Nanam Tembo, and I've been here for 18 years. Excuse me. My God. <coughs> it doesn't matter. Anyway, thank you very much for the beautiful speeches that you have given us today. I would like to point out a few issues that I think most of us as South Africans, even the international community, do for, uh, forget or overlook about South Africans in general. South Africa is a, a, a country that is very vibrant in terms of culture, different ethnicities, and everything. But most of the debates that have been held and that I've seen in the media and everywhere, we seem to forget that there are ordinary South Africans who live in the townships, who live in the farms, who live in every different sphere where we know the, dem the demographic uh, uh, situation of South Africa. Right now, I think uh, most of the things that you are discussing mainly pertain to the rich people, the middle class, those who can afford. What about those who cannot afford? In terms of when the NC took, <coughs> took over as government, yes, the policies were there, the fiscal policy, the economic policies, everything was there. But then it only cre it made more problems for ordinary citizens, created the biggest gap that we see now, that is a problem between the rich and the poor in South Africa. So who amongst us and amongst all the leaders, whether in politics, economics, are looking into the best interests of the poor people of South Africa? Now what we're having, we're seeing all these problems are, that are, are created, is the anger coming from the people who do not working, they, but they cannot afford to even own a four-roomed house. They cannot even buy property. They are mainly consumers. But then South Africa is a big playground for the rich. They come, they buy properties in the rich areas, in beautiful places. South Africa is a beautiful country. Everybody needs to enjoy a piece of land in South Africa. Are we here just merely talking about those people who can afford only? We need to think of those people. And how can you be rich and still enjoy when other people are poor? We are not going to enjoy your, your spoils. Thank you. Should we take a couple of questions? Yes. And again, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Kelly Jo Bluen. I'm a PhD candidate at the London School of Economics. Um, and first of all, I just want to 
absolutely agree with everything that the person who just spoke said. Thank you. Uh, it's such important points. Uh, and I think very often these things are forgotten because it's who we choose to center and who we think is important and who our priorities are. So thank you for making that point. Um, I missed the beginning of the presentation, um, but I am doing a long-term project on the IRR. So I've read everything you've written, so I'm speaking to that. Um, and every time I engage with your research, I'm, I'm really struck by the way in which you're able to present, the Institute for Race Relations is able to present a political agenda masquerading as research. Um, there's a complete failure to engage with the extensive literatures on land reform. Um, all of the evidence point, points to the fact that in the context of massive inequalities split along race lines, South Africa needs structural transformation of the economy. And unless you build a broad wealth base for the majority through land redistribution, amongst other things, there is no viable future for South Africa. And that this is not some kind of radical lefty Marxist view. This is all over the Financial Times last week. This is in the New York Times. This is wide consensus in this. And, and if you don't agree with that, at least engage it. Um, but I think it's, it's worth noting that IR's, IR's output's are always political. Um, and I, I don't know who the audience is, but I don't know the extent to which you are aware that IRR in South Africa is widely regarded as a white supremacist hate group. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's manifested in flagrant disregard for methodological standards in its research, manipulation of data to suit its agenda. No, I haven't. I'm going to finish. No, I'd like to finish this point. I just, I just want to, I'm going to just make one point and then I'll stop. Thank you. Women should be allowed to finish their points. Um, yes, all. Um, so I just, I mean, I, I, I just want to say that I think um, when you're coming here to do your lobbying thing, it, it's more respectful to your audience um, to um, be a little bit more honest about what you're doing. If you've got flagrant disregard for methodological and ethos, ethical standards in research, failure to engage literature on the issues researched, consistently doing research in the search service of a politics of racism, it is disingenuous to come to London and present yourself as a think tank and your research is credible. It would be more honest and respectful to the intelligence of your audience to be clear that IR is a white supremacist hate group and that this talk is part of a broader lobbying program to maliciously and fallaciously suggest that white people are under threat in South Africa and to promote white supremacy globally. Thank you. Thanks. Well, those were very strong points. I, 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 let me, let me, I think we must, must uh, give them a chance to come back on them because, I mean, quite frankly, some of those were almost libelous. Um, but uh, we can both come back on, the, on both of those points. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks very much for the comments from the audience. Um, so, I mean, in the introduction, I spoke to the purpose of the, the Institute, which is broadly about promoting a free and prosperous South Africa. And just in relation to, to Nana's remarks, um, I think it is precisely the poor people that you refer to, um, the working poor, the unemployed, um, that, that we're trying to advocate on behalf of. Uh, I mean, in my discussion around the labor market um, and the points that I made regarding uh, the dynamics between COSATU, the Trade, Federa Trade Union Federation, and the ANC. I mean, what we have in effect is a, a labor aristocracy in South Africa, that we have uh, a, a group of, of people, an, an interest group, um, that has a very powerful hold over the government, and which uses that power to, to basically lock out the poor, who are seen as, as competitors to their, to their positions. And the national minimum wage is a, is a feature of that. Um, and as I mentioned, we have 10 million people in South Africa who don't have jobs. And where are those jobs going to come from? They're not going to come from the state. The civil service has already increased by about 30%. Country's running out of money. We're operating at a, at a, a fiscal deficit now of minus 4.5%. That deficit is financed through borrowing. That's unsustainable. Our credit rating is, is going to be downgraded to junk status by Moody's. So the cost of capital is going to, to go through the roof. Um, so the only way that we can uh, generate prosperity for South Africa is through 
uh, creating an enabling environment for business. And business is the largest employer in South Africa. But businesses need to have certainty and confidence in the future in order to, to invest and to expand their operations and to hire more people. And you know the, the consequences for those 10 million people who don't have jobs on their sense of self, on their sense of self-worth, um, their ability to provide for themselves and their families is, is, is so consequential. It's really the most urgent problem that we have in South Africa. And in our polling, in, uh, in our surveys, we recently released uh, the HOPE report. And you know, this is a report that we've been uh, doing for a number of years now. I'm sure Kelly Joe will be uh, familiar with it. You know, we, we ask people, what, we, what are your, the most pressing issues that you think the government should be focusing on? And consistently, time and time again, number one is, is the economy and, and job creation. And education and, and health care is followed shortly there, thereafter. And, and quite far down the list, often one or two percent of respondents say land reform or, or race-based politics issues. Um, you know, so you know, I think that we're on the side of the, the, that kind of missing middle, the, the, the voiceless people in, in South Africa who are not being uh, heard by our political elites and our intelligentsia and the press and you know, people who, who don't have opportunities. Uh, you know, for those who are fortunate enough to have tertiary education, to be part of the, the skilled workforce, you can enjoy a very high standard of living in South Africa and uh, you know, that, uh, that access to opportunity is critical. But uh, for the vast kind of underclass in South Africa, they don't have those opportunities. They're reliant on welfare payouts by the state and uh, you know, they eke out, eke out a living. And the situation is unsustainable. We have a dramatic increase in the number of violent service delivery protests in the country. Uh, you know, we have uh, huge levels of, of criminality in the country, lots, lots of violence. Um, and I think a lot of it is a, is a feature of this kind of social dislocation, where people don't feel like they have a stake in the future. And uh, you know, I think it's very important to, to give people uh, opportunities to, to prove themselves. And unfortunately, the current policy framework is just not conducive to that. But can you come back to the allegation that you ignore, uh, ignore the evidence? Um, no, we certainly don't ignore evidence. I mean, a lot of the data that we use is drawn from public sources, so Statistics South Africa, National Treasury, um, and we, you know, our, we, our research credibility is is our is our core, uh, you know, core to to who we are as an organisation. Uh, you know, we we obviously have a particular view of the world. Um, we we want to promote. Uh, more liberty in South Africa, more individual choice and freedom, and the rule of law, non-racialism. These are core ideas that the Institute has always stood for and will continue to stand for. Um, and you know, we are also non-racial uh, in our approach. Uh, we have a very diverse uh, group of people working for us from different, uh, you know, racial and uh, ethnic backgrounds and. We're certainly not white supremacist. Um, we don't hire on the basis of race. We hire on the basis of the capabilities that those individual people bring to our organization. And many of them, like Cicle Ngobese, uh, Gwen Nguenya, who is our past chief operating officer, uh, you know, they might uh, disagree, Kelly Jo, with your, with your interpretation of, of our organization. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we do get this, this kind of criticism a lot. And I think a lot of it is rooted on the fact that we're often very critical of, of race-based policies, uh, which and race-based policy is, has infused uh, uh, has infused our entire political discourse. Um, and part of our role is to challenge that. Thank you. Yes, some more questions you wanted to make. Hi, I'm I'm Keatley. Um, I was interested and you definitely had a lot of validity about if we do want to grow South Africa in the future trying to sort of equalize a, a bit more of resources in the country. Um, Dave you responded to that talking about helping to promote business um, but do you think it is just a pure demand side issue. You mentioned in your report you're talking about education stats etc. I mean there are jobs going unfilled, there is a sort of lack of entrepreneurial a sort of interest. 
um, or maybe uh, sort of resources to do that. What can we do to try and support people? If business is not going to step up to the mark for a while in the medium term, what else can we do? Other questions? Yeah. Um, okay, hi. Yeah. My name is Iris. I'm a PhD student at London Business School. And I was wondering what do you think about the migrant situation? What do you expect to happen in the future? And what do you think South Africa should do as a country to make sure everything goes well? One last one. Sorry, Martin. Um, just to the first part of the last question. Migration. 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 Yeah, okay. Hi, evening. My name's Rob. I work in the finance sector here. Uh, I believe in capitalist markets. It's uh, it's the best way to pull people out of out of poverty, and some countries are doing it. Unfortunately, South Africa isn't. Uh, I just want your comments on Herbin Mashaba's process now in terms of expropriating buildings in Johannesburg. What process is he using? And do you think it's a direct? <coughs> uh, yeah, what process is he using? And please just uh, explain the difference between that and what the ANC want to do. Thank you. Since you haven't had a go. All right. So I think it's interesting to look at what Herman's done. Um, without a doubt, you have someone who put themselves out as a libertarian. Uh, you know, his. Uh, he describes himself as a capitalist before he becomes uh, mayor. Um, and as mayor is in this difficult position because uh, as much as they're not in a formal coalition with the EFF, they're in a voting coalition. And so the EFF's economic views are totally different to the DA's economic views and they've done quite a good job of pulling them in the direction that they want. Um, so Herman was very quick to say, we are going to be the first city to start expropriating without compensation. But his claim is we're going to do it in terms of the current constitution. And so what they're looking at is they've identified, I think it's 37 um, abandoned industrial plants in the city. Uh, and the idea is um, that if they are truly abandoned, um, then they are ownerless. And the state can then expropriate them um, without paying compensation. There is no one to pay. Um, and then turn that into to housing. So I think on its face, that's not totally objectionable. In other words, you can say, well, there's a housing problem. There's clearly, they reckon they'd be able to house 3,000 people in the inner city, and there's a high demand. It would be low-cost housing. It would be helping the poor and vulnerable. Um, and you, you're not infringing on a true property right. Now, what you've got to just ensure is that there really is no owner, that it is genuinely abandoned. South African law recognizes the idea of things being res nullius if they've been abandoned and they are ownerless, um, and therefore to put them to some use um, seems unobjectionable to my mind. Um, but they are, so in other words, what, what the DA envisages is very different from what the ANC and the EFF envisage. The EFF have said they want a policy of total nationalization. In other words, no one should ever be allowed to own land at all. Um, black or white, rich or poor, um, the idea is that you will be allocated land by the state uh, on a 25-year rental basis. Um, which kind of follows a Soviet model. So that basically, um, if you play nice, and you show your good communist credentials, well, then you get to move into this wonderful house in Santon. Um, if you do things that the party doesn't like, well, then we're going to evict you and we're going to send you off to the hinterland uh, or to Mexico where we can stick an ice pick in your head. So the ANC line, in a way, is to try and say, well, we're not as nuts as those uh, you know, Red Beret guys. You know, we're just going to take some people's stuff. Um, we're not going to be you know, the custodian of all property yet, although they are the custodian of all minerals and the custodian uh, of all water rights. Um, and in a way, there's this interesting view about how you view the relationship between the ANC and the EFF, which is, is the EFF really an opposition party? Or is it the ANC Youth League in exile, um, who then acts really as kind of pathfinder and puts out the extreme position and then checks, you know, is there an appetite for this? And if so, then you follow. Um, and you get to do things like pretend you're being reasonable because you're not asking for everything that, you know, your pathfinder wants. Um, and so that is the sort of game that's being played. But at the moment, the DA line looks largely unobjectionable. Um, but 
the problem with the party is that um, their line on principles is, if you don't like our principles, don't worry, we've got plenty of others, you know, um, and have sort of been caught in this lust for power, which has backfired because for the first time in the party's history, they've gotten less votes than they did in prior elections. And they seem to be selling themselves as a kind of ANC light, but less corrupt and more efficient. Um, and so what worries me about them is that um, they'll be very efficient socialists and that Herman will actually expropriate people's land. And then once he gets the taste for those buildings and the sort of vote garnering thing, who knows where he'll go after that. Okay, I'll deal with the question on migration first. Uh, so, um, South Africa is in an interesting position because, in many ways, uh, you need to think of uh, our immigration policy in in two tiers. So, uh, in the one sense, uh, South Africa has very porous borders, has a very long geographic border. Um, and has a, a history of migrant labor coming from countries like Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, if you go to any restaurant in Johannesburg today, your waitress or waiter is likely to be a Zimbabwean or your, your Uber driver. Um, and, and, and that is, uh, that is a historical uh, trend. Um, and you, know, you hear anecdotes of people being deported to Harare one day and then uh, you know, a week later they're, they're back in their job. Um, so, so South Africa has has been unable to effectively police and control its border, uh, and uh, there are you know large migrant communities from Ethiopia, Nigeria, etc. Um, and for the most part, uh, you know those people they don't benefit from uh, national minimum wage legislation uh, or, or some of the other labour protections. They're they're uh, economically productive and they add a, a lot uh, to the country in terms of uh, wealth generation and they offer services and, and goods uh, often at competitive prices that uh, that ordinary South Africans uh, you know complain bitterly about their, their competitors don't lower their prices uh, they choose rather to uh, assault and, and attack uh, these these foreign owned businesses so uh, very sadly we've had a spate of, of xenophobic uh, attacks in the country uh, over the last 10 years, uh, most notably I think in, in 2008 uh, and then again in around 2015. Um, so that's a lamentable situation. Um, and, but on the other hand, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of people are, you know, given the trends that we spoke about, rising unemployment, etc., you know, feeling uh, like they need a scapegoat. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, we view those xenophobic attacks as a, as a symptom of, of the failures of, of ANC economic policy. Uh, but then on the, the upper tier in terms of the skilled economy, it's very difficult for skilled individuals uh, you know, from Europe, the UK, America, to, to actually uh, do business in South Africa. South Africa is a very attractive location and jurisdiction in which to live. Um, I personally, throughout my career, have, have met uh, you know, many people in professional capacity from other jurisdictions who've been unable to, to continue working in South Africa. They, you know, they want to settle, they want to raise their family in South Africa, it's very difficult to do so and uh, the National Department of Home Affairs makes it exceedingly difficult to settle. Um, you know, so our, our position would be to, to advocate for a much more liberalized uh, framework uh, of, of immigration. Um, and to, to attract the foreign skills that, that we need. Unfortunately, the government views this uh, as, as only a threat, uh, only contributing to increased unemployment. Uh, they don't see the opportunities that, that these highly skilled people um, could, could bring to South Africa in terms of capital, skills, uh, and know-how. Um, so, so I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's a two-tiered story. Uh, and then Keatley, you, you spoke about the, 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 the supply side. Um, yeah, so, I mean, our education system is not working. Uh, we have a, a very generous fiscal allocation in terms of our budget, uh, but, we, but we don't get that return on investment, unfortunately. Um, so uh, the quality of our maths and science education is ranked 128th out of 140 countries in the world, according to the World Economic Forum. Uh, you know, which is uh, below many uh, countries which are in, uh, you know, states of uh, civil unrest and, you know, so uh, we, we're punching well beneath our weight in that regard. Uh, and, and as the Institute of Race Relations, we advocate 
uh, uh, for crowding in the private sector into, into education. The state could still play a role in terms of the provision of welfare in the form of a, of a voucher. Um, but then consumers of that service uh, could then choose the schools in which they send their children to uh, rather than being allocated to the school based on their geographic area. Um, and so, uh, you know, this would enable low-cost uh, private education providers like Spark Schools, those kind of organizations to, you know, to meet that, that demand. And then we would start to see an improvement uh, in terms of the pipeline of skills. Because you're right, we, we, there's no shortage of people who uh, want to work. Uh, but whether they can actually perform uh, in, a, in a complex uh, services-oriented economy is, is another question. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so th th this voucher program uh, forms part of uh, what the IRR is advocating as, the, as economic uh, empowerment for the disadvantaged, which is a, a non-racial uh, empowerment program which would seek uh, to, to develop people not based on their racial criteria, um, but but actually uh, on in terms of need and their level of advantage. Have I have I missed any questions, Mark? I'm just conscious that uh, we're running out of time, and Pumzile also had a question. Let's just have a couple of questions. Then we'll okay, great. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah. If you wouldn't mind uh, just keeping it fairly short and saying, I'll keep it fairly short, and oh. uh, you know, okay. say your name. Uh, I'll be very short because he has already said what. Speaking. Uh, or I'll be very short because you have already said what I wanted to say. Uh, I was going to comment about land. Born and bred in rural areas, <clears throat> as far as I know, when I was growing up, there was never any shortage of land for us because there was communal land. The only shortage of land is because most people are immigrating to to the urban areas, and then when they went, when they go there, they build sheds to be near towns, and then there are RDP houses which are built, and people sell them to they sell them, and then they go to and build sheds in towns. They, shell, they sell them to, to the illegal immigrants. And 80% 80, 80 of sheds in South Africa are occupied by illegal immigrants. So I think the problem is that the ANC is not able to rule the country. I'm sorry to say that. Thank you. OK, last question, Will. Just introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Will van der Merwe, um, and I work in risk industry analysis, uh, and I've been part of the DA abroad over here in the UK. Um, so, in in recent years, we've we've seen a lot of um, kind of non-substantive catchphrases, like um, obviously it, there's not much substance and not, not much clarity behind uh, uh, expropriation without compensation, as you mentioned. We've also seen radical economic transformation, which was a big buzzword, but nothing in policy. We also saw a white monopoly capital, uh, which was linked to Bell Pottinger. Now, all of these are, are populist notions, and however, they are actually based on kind of fundamental social issues, underlying social issues, and then a populist story built on top of it. Um, and these social issues are essentially failures of government to address them. Um, and what creating a populist notion about that does is distracts from the government failure and, and causes racial divide to, to essentially distract from that. Um, so it's a, it's a politically advantageous uh, politically advantageous thing to create a populist uh, buzzword and a notion and introduce it to the narrative. So my question is, with the other, with those the other phrases, nothing actually happened. They were just there to kind of create populism to essentially, I would say, devalue and uh, create a racial divide so that there was less support for the for the opposition party. Um, and that anyone who was criti criticizing government was put in the other camp. 
Um, so do you think there is real intention um, behind to actually follow through on this? Or do you think it was, because I, I thought at one point that it might be just a, a, a populist narrative to, before the elections. Do you think there's actually intention to expropriate private property given the research and given what um, the outcomes are likely to be? Sorry, can, can I? Just to add to that, my name is Stephen Kruger, it's very quick. Just to, to um, add to what Will is saying here, if, if one just looks at the, the mass behind this, <clears throat> how many houses out there that you could possibly redistribute to 60 odd million people? So my question is, I think the answer is around 5 million or maybe 4 million, but you've got 60 million people, as a lady in the corner very rightfully points out that need to be satisfied. So what happens when you run out of houses? Oh, stuff. So I think there's a danger in pretending that just because we've got a heightened rhetoric that hasn't burst yet, that it won't burst. And David talked earlier about the xenophobic violence we had in South Africa in 2008. So I think 78 people were killed, um, a number were burnt alive on the grounds that they are not us, they are not South African, they are other, they are not human beings. Um, there's a famous case of a Mozambican man named Ernesto Namuwe um, who was shot, stabbed and ultimately set alight in front of the police and in front of photographers um, because he is not us. And so when you take this line of these white colonial supremacists are not us. They came to our shores as thieves, as rapists, as murderers, and they're white monopoly capital and they pull the strings. You can play that game for a while without having any real effect. And eventually you will have a boiling over of violence. And we're starting to see it um, in farm murders. So there's some very interesting data around farm murders. Um, the original view was that when looking at those numbers, that there were about three times the average murder rate in South Africa, which is very high. We have 54 people that are murdered every day in South Africa. And a lot of that violence happens to black people and in townships, and it's horrendous. Um, but once you realize that the number of people that are killed by intruders in South Africa are actually a very small percentage of those that are murdered, that most people are killed by people that they know through personal interactions or in bar fights, things like that, whereas every single farmer that is killed is killed in an intruder attack, the number looks like 18 times the national average. And a fair amount of the time, it's not for an economic purpose. It's overtly racial. You have um, people writing, kill the Boer in blood on people's walls, uh, that people are tortured to death, um, that hot irons are put onto their feet, that their, um, their knees are drilled, um, that we are seeing these eruptions of violence because these Boers uh, came and stole our land and they are not us and we can treat them differently and we can kill them with impunity. So I think we must recognize that, that there is an actual problem that may result in genuine acts of violence and already is. Um, on the question as to, well, what's from a pause's game here? Is it just more empty rhetoric? I think you've got two choices. The one is he's a liar. In other words, when he said um, as ANC president, as he was elected, we are going to expropriate without compensation. And when he said it as South African president, on numerous occasions, we're going to expropriate without compensation. You can say, ah, it's just lies. Um, he's like every other politician, he's just lying. Or you can take the radical view that um, Catherine Onslan takes, which is you believe him, in which case he's a thief. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to take your stuff and give you nothing for it. Um, that's thievery. And once you add in, uh, we're going to take it from these people, these Boers, these whites, these people, then it's just racist thievery. So those are your options on that front. I think business wants to believe that this was a vote-gating exercise, that it was some way of neutering the EFF. Well, it didn't. The EFF doubled in size. The ANC lost figures. If anything, they did, they did was build a platform for a radical leftist organization to espouse hatred and call for um, you know, massive invasions of people's property rights, which in all likelihood, if they get their constitutional amendment, will hurt the poorest of the poor the most. Uh, Leon Lowe from the Free Market Foundation has a standing bet of 100,000 Rand, where he says, in the next two years, if there's a constitutional change, he says, I guarantee you, no rich white person will have their land taken from them because they can afford lawyers like me. 
if you're a poor black person living in a township, what are you going to do about it? We're going to come in here, we're going to bulldoze your stuff, you have no property rights, we'll build what we want, tough. You know, especially if you're some Mozambican foreigner, well then you're not even a real South African anyway, I don't care if you're black and poor and vulnerable. So there is a real threat. If someone like Kelly cares about the poor and vulnerable, then I would suggest that you care about property rights and you care about their well-being. Uh, yeah, I'm just conscious of time, but I should also note that, that we have made provision for some drinks afterwards, so we can certainly continue the discussion for anyone who wants to, to stick around. Um, no, I'm sorry, we don't have time. We really don't. You've already had a set. Uh, um, uh, you'd be most welcome to, to, to take that up with Mark, I think, over a glass of wine, if you still have time. Um, and, and then, um, Pumzila, I don't think your, your question was, was addressed. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my, my sentiments are similar to Mark's. Um, you know, I don't think you, uh, you achieve meaningful land reform by diluting private property rights. The Peruvian economist uh, Hernando de Soto has written uh, you know, uh, very eloquently in his book, the, the Other Path, about the importance of giving private property rights to the poor. Uh, many poor people, they have, you know, they have basic assets, um, but, uh, you know, they're unable to, to leverage those assets. Uh, they don't have any legal recourse when uh, a, a government bureaucrat tries to, to take it away from them. Um, and uh, De Soto speaks about this idea of dead capital. Um, that you know you just you, you have capital but you can do nothing with it uh, so strengthening the private property rights framework is the best way and many jurisdictions have shown that and in order to build long-term wealth intergenerational wealth which is which is essential for South Africa's prosperity um, but yeah I, th I think we, we've run out of time of, um, and, and j just in conclusion uh, if you've like what you heard here today and if you would like to support our cause we have the the friends uh, program the friends campaign so you can uh, you know pledge your support to us uh, in terms of a, a monthly financial commitment or a or a once-off commitment um, and uh, you'll be part of our of our friends uh, support network um, you know we uh, see ourselves as acting on the behalf of of, of the uh, the moderate core of South Africa, which, which we feel is ignored in the press and uh, amongst the chattering classes. Um, and so, but we need uh, your help in order to, to amplify our voice. Um, so, so please do visit our website. There's lots of interesting uh, research and material on there. We're always very transparent about our methodology uh, and the, the process that we follow. Um, so I would encourage you to, to explore that website and, and, and join us in our uh, quest to achieve a more free, open and prosperous South Africa. Um, well, thank you. Can we just uh, show our appreciation to David and Mark for what they've had to say? Thank you very much.